Well, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. I'd like to welcome everybody, welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest and a very, very important topic. Uh, and I'm delighted that we can have a conversation today. Now, what I'd really like to do is to welcome this week's guest. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome La Jeune Corniche. She is at Court at Ithaca College, where she's the provost, as well as a senior vice president for academic affairs. I've met her this year um, during various video conferences. Like most people, we haven't met in person, of course, um, but I found her to be absolutely brilliant and to be in an incredibly challenging position. Ithaca College has wrestled with COVID, has wrestled with racism, and really gone through the fires. And I'm delighted that she can join us to share with us what she's learned in the process. Uh, so please, welcome, welcome, Lejeune. Thank you so much, Brian, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted you could make it. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I when I invite academic leaders to the forum, and I want them to introduce themselves, I find that it's best to ask people to look ahead a bit um, and to say, in order to introduce yourself, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? You know, What are the big challenges? What are the big projects that are uppermost in your mind? Well, for the next year, I will be working on continuing to help right-size the college. Mm -hmm. We have a strategic plan, uh, which we started in the fall of 2018. And one of the goals of that plan was to determine and maintain a sustainable size for the institution, um, academic programs, structures, and associated resources at every level of the institution. We thought when we created this plan uh, that would start in 19 and end in 24, that we would have five years to complete our plan or implement our plan. Uh, and then we ran into COVID this fall in the first year of implementation, which has necessitated that we accelerate our plan. Mm. We have to reduce the size of our faculty, which mm. was something we knew we were going to do again in advance, but the challenges associated with COVID have made us, uh, it has required that we do this sooner than, than we thought. Um, I'm looking at the work ahead as it, in three parts. Mm -hmm. One is aligning the size of our faculty with the size of our student body. I don't know if anybody else has experienced in drops in enrollment. Mm -hmm. I arrived at Ithaca College in the fall of 2018 or summer of 2018 mm -hmm. with 6,500 students. In the fall of 2020, uh, we had we had 5,100 students. And Ooh. so, yes, this, so there was a particular Ooh. drop. In, in student enrollment over time. Uh, if we had looked at this over a period of 10 years, which we have subsequently done, mm. we have seen that our enrollment had been dropping over a 10 year period. Mm. Enrollment was decreasing and the size of the faculty was increasing. And so uh, I found myself to be in the position of having to do that which could have and should have been addressed perhaps before I arrived, but must be addressed now in order to ensure that the institution not only survives, but thrives into mm -hmm. the future. So part one is alignment. Part two is restructuring and reorganizing. How do we restructure our academic programs, our, our administrative structure even, uh, our school structure, to optimize the resources that we have. Our resources are, are very finite. And so uh, we need to take a look at resources across the institution, ask ourselves the question about whether or not we're using them appropriately. And then uh, part three is strategic growth. Where can we invest in new programs strategically, again, to help the college thrive uh, beyond this moment? And so as I look forward, those are the things that will guide my work, not only for the next year, but for the next three years. Mm. Well, I, I have to say, um, Provost Cornish, that you're coming right off the bat and telling me the most difficult things. Uh, and I admire that. Um, I, I was going to um, ask you some um, gentler and easier things and you went right right to the wire. Thank you. Uh, I, that's That's not easy to do. Um, friends, I'm going to ask um, uh, our provost a couple of questions. 
but the purpose of the forum is for you to ask questions. Uh, so again, if you'd like to share your thoughts, uh, if you'd like to ask uh, our guest a question, either just head to that uh, question mark button at the bottom of the screen and type them in, or press the raised hand button uh, to join us up here on stage. It's really, really quite easy. Uh, I guess my, my the first question I'd, I'd like to ask is that question of strategic growth. Um, insofar as you can share it with us right now, where do you think the areas are for that kind of growth? Is it uh, say allied healthcare, especially because we're in a pandemic. Is there anything lo in the local issue? In I'm sorry, in local area in uh, New York that's especially resonant. Mm -hmm. Where are the growth zones? So we you know we have a school of health sciences and human performance. Mm. So we have seen an uptick in applications to our school of health sciences. Uh, and human performance. We are calling it the Dr. Fauci effect, but it is definitely having an effect as more and more students are interested in going into the health sciences. We are applying right now to uh, bring on a PA program to the college. So we're hoping that we get accredited to start a physician assistant program. You know, Ithaca, New York, uh, it, we're in a rural area, and so there are health challenges here. And how can we invest in programs that will help our students be able to help people who live in the community where we are? We call ourselves a private college serving the public good. And so we see an opportunity in our health scientists in particular to have some strategic growth. That makes a lot of sense. And that's what I'm seeing nationwide. Um, and uh, I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, Back actually, back in I don't know if I mentioned this to you when I when I last saw you, uh, but back in March I was forecasting that we would see a big rise in in allied health as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I love the name, the Dr. Fauci effect. Um, we had a quick question. Let me just bring this up on stage. So again, if you're all new to the forum, let me just explain how this works. Um, so we have Alexia Pritchard asked a question in the chat, and I just put up here on the screen so everyone can see it. Are you thinking about online learning initiatives? as part of how you think Ithaca should invest? Great question, and thank you for the question, Alexis. So I go back to, to March the 6th, mm -hmm. uh, when things started to turn. We were on spring break when we decided not to bring our students back for the spring semester. And so what we did was we extended our spring break for a week so that we could get some quick professional development to our faculty mm -hmm. to help them try to pivot from face-to-face -face face -to -face instruction to online learning. Um, what this has done is provided our faculty with a new set of skills that they did not have a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we spent the summer learning. Uh, we got feedback from students about what worked well, what didn't work well in the spring feedback from faculty about what they knew and what they didn't know and how much they wanted to learn. And so over the summer, we developed a flexible by design summer institute in our Center for Faculty Excellence in conjunction with our teaching and learning with technology uh, colleagues. And so our, our faculty spent three weeks specifically intentionally designing online classes to implement in the fall. We were hoping that we could be on campus in the fall, but I asked the faculty to design their courses as if they needed to be taught online with the hope that we could be present. But if we couldn't, it would be far easier to pivot from online to face to face than it is from face to face to online. And so I'm delighted that our faculty now have a new set of skills that we can leverage moving into the future. One of our strategic planning goals is to be a 12 month campus. And so now that we have acquired all of these new online skills, we can teach courses winter and summer. So we can you know, allow our students to have an opportunity to learn year round and we can be a 12 month campus. So short answer to your question, yes, this is an opportunity for us to invest in online learning and, and we intend so to do. Great question, Alexia. and um, and. Thank you, Lucia. That was just a perfect, perfect answer. Um, again, if you're new to the forum, this is one way you can you can quickly type in a question, and we get to address it. Um, and we have another question. Oh, actually, the questions are just piling in. I don't have to ask; they're all coming over. So let me uh, let me grab one from uh, someone who I think may be a neighbor of you. 
Um, uh, this is from Amy Cronin at the New York Six Liberal Arts Consortium. And Amy asks, how do external partnerships factor into your thinking about how to optimize resources and grow strategically? Yeah, good question. So we have the CMC, our, our community, uh, our Cayuga Medical Center, and they are strategic partners with us if we can get our PA program approved and on board. Our students mm -hmm. are going to need rotations. And so this is our local you know, hospital. And so they're going to help with that. We have partnered with our school system to see how we can be resources for the students in our Ithaca City schools. Um, and so, you know, we partner with with Cornell, our colleagues, you know, on the other hill. Uh, Mike Kotlikoff is the provost at, at Cornell University. Uh, Mike and I are in, in contact with one another on a regular basis. Paul Reisendorf is our, our provost at Tompkins Community, Tompkins Cortland Community College. And so the three of us are always in touch with one another about how we can assist one another. But speaking about that Cornell partnership for a moment, you know, I met with Mike in, in November and I said, Mike, can you just tell me what you have learned from bringing students on campus this fall about your surveillance testing protocol? Because Cornell has been very successful in this. And he said, you know, those during the biggest lesson was that the spread was not occurring in classrooms. The spread was occurring as students gathered with each other outside of the classroom experience. And so that community contract or compact is very important. And, and students need to, to, I'm gonna use the word police themselves, encourage themselves to engage in, in behaviors that will decrease the likelihood of spread across the community. Uh, Mike and I are gonna meet again on Monday to talk about subsequent learning that's happened since we last got together. But we're also gonna talk about the opportunities for us to partner with Cornell, if possible, uh, to help us with our surveillance testing in the spring in conjunction with Cayuga Medical Center. So the, the medical center is helping the colleges and schools in the area with the surveillance testing. So that's another example of partnership that's happening in Ithaca. Oh, that's a great question. And uh, by the way, the New York Six is a group of six liberal arts colleges across the uh, upstate area of New York, and they do some really great work in sharing resources. I'm a big fan. Um, and uh, thank you for that question. Uh, now, uh, just to give you another sense of the capabilities of what we can do, let me just bring uh, up on stage uh, one of um, our long-term friends and supporters and someone who always asks great questions. This is Tom Hames coming to you from the Houston, Texas area. Hello, Tom. Hey there. Good to see you. Um, good to see you guys. So a quick question. I know you were talking earlier about, um, you know, right-sizing the college, uh, eliminate, potentially eliminating programs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't usually hear in these discussions is um, the possibility for increased interdisciplinary work. Uh, I think one of the problems that we have is, of course, there are way too many silos in academia, especially on the teaching side. Um, and it seems to me that there's a lot of efficiencies to be realized by creating a broader set of programs. My concern with eliminating you know, bits and pieces is that you know, once you start chopping off fingers, you eventually don't have a functional hand. And um, that's, you know, that I, I'm just wondering how much of that is uh, is part of your discussion. Thank you so very much for the question. I'm going to go back to our strategic plan. Uh, one of our strategic planning goals is cur increased uh, curricular flexibility, interdisciplinarity uh, and collaboration. You know, I, I came from a small liberal arts college. I was at Goucher College for 20 years before I came to Ithaca, New York. And what, what fascinates me about Ithaca College is that we are a comprehensive college rooted and grounded in the liberal arts tradition, but we have four professional schools. What has frustrated me is uh, the degree to which these silos prevent us from providing interdisciplinary opportunities for our students. Uh, something as simple as a common schedule grid uh, would just allow us to, to break down some of these walls. And so part of the work that we are doing is really having deep conversations about how we can provide more interdisciplinary opportunities for our students. I mean, we've got the liberal arts school, which is HS. We've got health sciences and human performance. We have a school of business, a school of music, and the Park School of Communications. The opportunities at Ithaca College are golden. And so I would love for the faculty to have an opportunity to engage in conversation about how we maximize 
what we have and really make it exciting for students. And I'm going to keep going for a minute. So, you know, my faculty have a 4-3 teaching load in, in some of the schools, which to me is just tremendous. How can you be strategic planning goal, a model for student success, engagement and well-being when your faculty are teaching seven courses a year, your students are taking five or six courses a semester, depending upon the requirements for the major. And so what I've asked the faculty to consider is this over the course of the next two, possibly three years, because it will take some time. But can we do a curricular overhaul? Can we do a complete curricular transformation? Can we move to a one, two, and four credit system, which would allow our students to take four courses per semester and our faculty to have a three, two teaching load? Scholarship research informs teaching. So how do we create a situation, conditions, where faculty can engage in their scholarship, but then students can engage in deep learning. It would help student well-being. It would increase faculty engagement with students. And I've asked the faculty to think about this. I've been talking about this quite a bit this week. And so um, I'm looking forward to seeing if, if faculty take me up on the offer. Well, I, I, I wish you the best of luck in that. I mean, I think a lot of the disciplinary divisions that we have are a legacy of the specialization of the industrial age. And they're not really very useful or relevant if you go outside the field. I mean, I consider myself to be a technologist. My degrees are in political science, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> but thank you for that great answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Oh, thank you so much for uh, for coming up. And uh, Tom, by the way, just not to sell him short, also teaches classes in government uh, very, very creatively, very imaginatively. He's uh, Idea Spaces Net is his handle on his website. And uh, he's someone definitely you should be following. Um, and thank you, Lejeune, for that very optimistic and, and positive response. Um, we have more questions coming in. My God, let me just get out of the way here and put them up on the, on the screen. Um, we have a question from... Uh, uh, Andrew Clark at Educause, actually, who, who wanted to come back to that question of programs growing. Uh, and he asked about a framework. What type of framework did you create to evaluate your programs to determine where to grow and what should go? So, you know, we, we have a data dashboard. Um, and so it, it tells us lots of things. It tells us about student interests, student demand, number of majors, number of minors, number of credit hours generated. Mm -hmm. uh, third semester retention, fifth semester retention, graduation rate, and we can look at it over a period of five years. And so we're also taking a holistic approach because we also know that the numbers don't tell the whole story. You know, an academic discipline might have few majors, but it could be a service discipline for the institution and provide many service credit hours. And so uh, we had an academic program prioritization uh, action group that was tasked with designing guiding principles that would help the folks doing the work look at our academic programs. And so that implement the, the, the guiding principles were given to our implementation committee. We have spent the fall looking at all of our academic programs. At the end of this month, the implementation committee will create a document called the shape of the, the shape of the college document. How will we look moving forward? They will recommend programs for consolidation, discontinuance, uh, growth, and reimagination. Over the month of January, the entire college community will be given the opportunity to provide comments on the shape of the college document. The document will be submitted to me and the president during the month of February. And then before the end of February, we will announce the programs that have been recommended for consolidation, elimination, reorganization, and growth. Wow. Um, first of all, and thank you for the for the key in question, Andrew. I'm really glad you you um, specified that. And uh, again, uh, uh, Provost Cornish, thank you for that um, perfect answer. Just uh, just really, really detailed describing how you're going to do this. Uh, we have more questions coming in. And for those of you who are just joining us over the past few minutes, I'm so glad to see you again. This is the Future Transform. And our guest is Provost Lejeune Cornish from Ithaca College in upstate New York. I didn't get to ask an uh, important question. How much snow do you have already? <laughs> There was a light dusting uh, yesterday, and so uh, the, the ground is 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 clear today. So um, okay. maybe 
continue. <laughs> okay, well, as long as you can, I know exactly, exactly how that goes. Uh, we have a great question uh, from um, uh, Phil Long, uh, who's a great friend and a previous guest on the forum. And Phil asks, uh, from your emergency response experience going online quickly, what, if any, longer-term systematic changes might this have brought to light? Uh, how ill-equipped our classrooms were <laughs> uh, to, 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 to move in this direction. Mm. And so uh, prior to COVID, we had 30 classrooms capable of streaming, with streaming capabilities, let me put it to you that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a whole lot of work since the spring, and we now have 200 classrooms that have that capability. Uh, and so we made a major uh, investment in technology uh, be because, again, we want to leverage this technology moving forward. Uh, we've learned that our, our faculty continue to need professional development in designing and implementing online courses. But right now, the professional development that is needed and will happen over the month of January, because we will bring students back at the end of January prayerfully, is around dual instruction. You know, many of our courses will be hybrid in mm -hmm. the spring. Mm -hmm. Many of our students have chosen to remain home for the spring. So we have, to date, we have about 2,900 students who have committed to returning to campus in the spring. And we also have 700 students who have chosen to remain at home. So how can our faculty provide what I'm calling dual instruction, teaching those at home and those in the classroom that are socially distanced at the same time? And so we're going to spend the month of January providing our faculty with opportunities to practice with the technology because we know it's still a work in progress. Well, as usual, Phil Long asks a deep, good question, um, and, um, and Lejeune nails it um, right away. Um, that sounds like a high flex classroom. Is that the, a term you're all using? Well, thank you. Um, right now, that is the high flex classroom. That is what it is. And we've just called it dual instruction because our faculty said, do I have to do both at the same time? And I'm like, yes, we have to learn how to do both at the same time. And we know that we are, are growing in this area. Uh, we are not expecting perfection. We are expecting connection and, and continued engagement with our students. Hmm. In the in the chat, just really quickly, I put a link to the uh, um, our most recent session on HyFlex um, that we had. We invented the term, uh, Dr. Brian Beatty. So if you'd like to put that aside for uh, another time. Uh, also, Robert Mark Morgan um, just shared a, a link to a fascinating project. Let me quote from him there. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary program at Washington University in St. Louis. It's attempting to connect higher ed silos with everything for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary course offerings to a podcast, and there's a link to it there. Um, and I, Robert, I'm gonna have to follow up afterwards and, uh, and pick your brains about that, because that sounds fascinating. Um, we have a question that came in uh, earlier uh, from someone who can't make it today, and I want to put this up. This is from a wonderful, wonderful thinker who specializes in, among other things, uh, publication and uh, textbook materials, Michael Johnson, and he asks, now, after all of this stuff, in the middle of your big strategic you know, redesign, what programs are in place to help ensure students' path to graduation, the right classes, in the right order, in the right terms, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, great question. And so, you know, DegreeWorks is a wonderful program uh, that allows students to see where they are on, on their path to getting their degree. Uh, we had not, as an institution, uh, optimized or used all of the functionality of degree works to, to our best ability. And now we are putting that into practice for the spring semester because we really do need to know what our students need, what we're offering, uh, how available it will be for them to, to finish the path to, to graduation. And if we become the 12 month campus strategic planning goal, then courses that we know students need can be offered in the winter and in the summer so that we can help students graduate on time. Well, it may be that as you offer more and more classes online that uh, you get more and more flexibility for that. Absolutely. Michael, thank you for that question. Uh, and um, 
And now everybody, there's more questions are piling in. Oh, this is this is great. I'm going to see if I can combine a few of them because uh, this is so rich. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Sally uh, Muriamu uh, from Portland State uh, asks uh, a really key question here: How can the strategic mission be realized with shared faculty governance? Mm -hmm. There is, in my opinion, faculty resistance and disciplinarity. Yes, um, sometimes. Uh, but when we listen to students and they and they tell us what they're interested in, students vote with their feet and they vote with their seats. Uh, and as we look at which majors have increased, which minors have increased, which majors and minors have decreased over time, uh, it, it, it may tell faculty something. With regard to shared governance, the faculty have played a role. They We had a faculty committee that designed the guiding principles to a you know, to, to, to inform the academic program prioritization process. And so uh, can't do anything without the, the faculty's participation in this with regard to how positions will be eliminated and the order in which they will be lim eliminated. We have a faculty handbook and the faculty handbook clearly articulates the order in which this work must be done when we need to reduce the size of the faculty due to a decline in enrollment. And we are following section 4.9.8 of the faculty handbook to the T um, as faculty expect us to do. Well, that's a great question, Sally. And and I'm, I'm struck by how easily to mind you had that specific location in the regulate right there that's that's powerful um let's see we have e even more questions coming in um and so uh this is one that uh, kind of builds on uh, on tom hames's question and this is from uh, david hool who asks uh what is ethical college doing within the curriculum to develop problem solvers in climate change so we are about to launch a new Center for Climate Justice uh, that will be led by Sandra Steingraber. And we are really excited about that. We are, and it will be an interdisciplinary center for climate justice, combining our environmental science folks with some of our so folks in the natural sciences, some of my environmental studies people as well, uh, people from our political science department, from our history department, uh, from our Center for the Study of Race, uh, ethnicity, race, culture, and ethnicity. We are excited about it. Uh, we've just gotten funding. Uh, we got a million dollar grant given to the college to, to get it off the ground. But environmental justice is very important to our students as is climate justice. And so again, we are excited to launch a Center for Climate Justice at Ithaca College. That's great. Is any of that public yet? Uh, not quite. We are trying to get the dollars in and then we can announce. I hear that. I hear that. Um, I, I would just personally like to uh, follow up with you on that later on. Um, the uh, my next book project is looking for examples of uh, exactly that kind of thing. I'd be glad to uh, pick your brains and learn more about it and and, and to write about it. Um, David, good question. Very good question. Um, and then we have uh, let's see. Speaking of faculty, uh, we have a question from Gail Ballard at uh, North Idaho College, where I bet it can get pretty chilly right about now, Gail. Mm -hmm. uh, she asks about faculty development, professional development in general. Um, what kind of professional development opportunities do you have? Homegrown or third party? Homegrown. We have an amazing Center for Faculty Excellence, which is led by a faculty member from the Park School of, of Communications, whose area is systemic design, systems design. And Gordon Rowland is phenomenal yeah. at what he does. We have uh, what we call faculty fellows, uh, uh, faculty who are experts in, in teaching and scholarship, who get a, up to a six credit course release so that they can work with their colleagues within the Center for Faculty Excellence. So we have faculty helping, teaching, and providing professional development for their peers. And so uh, our Center for Faculty Excellence is, is absolutely amazing. Mm. No, that sounds great. That sounds terrific. Uh, and thank you for uh, raising the uh, uh, professional development question. Um, let's see, we also have uh, some uh, technology questions. But before we get to that, there's one more on the kind of uh, administrative uh, faculty side. And this is a follow up from Phil. Uh, and because he's Phil, I'll let him do this. Um, 
he uh, he asks, um, what kind of changes will you make in tenure? Um, some are, are thinking about ways of radically changing the workforce in different ways. For example, he says, are you, are you moving towards, you know, X year term appointments, you know, three? Absolutely not. Uh, I have told my faculty, it is my job as provost to advocate for the faculty. We believe in tenure. We are committed to tenure. We are committed to having tenure eligible faculty, and that will continue moving forward at Ithaca College. They will not, we are, we're not moving in the direction of, of term appointments. If I had my way, we would be 75% tenure to 25%, 80 to 20 if I could do it. But there is a real commitment to tenure at Ithaca College. Well, that's great. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Very good, very good. Sorry, I just, uh, I just quickly had to uh, refresh the page. Uh, thank you, Phil, for that very direct uh, answer. And thank you, uh, Lejeune, for that incredibly direct response. Um, that is uh, just, that's that's crucial to this. Now let's, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, Sarah San Gregorio just shouted uh, her delight at course release. Um, I mean, she put that in all caps with exclamation points. So I uh, just want to let you know that you've got another fan here. Um, we have uh, questions about um, technology. Uh, Stephen Ehrman, who is a wonderful, wonderful researcher on this, um, he asks, in your classrooms capable of streaming, can people outside that room hear what students say in the room? Can they see the student who is talking and gesturing? Now, I'm gonna put that on the screen again, that, that went away too quickly. I'm not sure about the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we've learned is that many of our classrooms weren't set up for this. Yeah. Some of the best classrooms have wide walls where, you know, this type of technology could be in use and people could see one another. We don't have a lot of those kinds of classrooms. And so I've seen faculty have an iPad maybe in front of them or use their computer screen while talking to the few students that are in front of them because of social distancing reasons for the same time, for the, at the same time. But I don't have an answer to that. Um, so that, that's something I need to investigate more. Uh, my technology guru, Dave Weil, who's also with Educause, by the way, uh, Dave has just done an amazing job helping to outfit our classrooms and get us ready for the spring. But I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the candor of the answer and I also appreciate the shout out to your tech guru. So. <laughs> Uh, who it looks like he's had to do an awful lot of work um, mm -hmm. uh, this semester. So kudos to him. Um, we uh, also had another question. Uh, Leslie Harris at Bucknell College asked, and I want to make sure that we get this back in. This is crucial. Um, the uh, title of the session mentions confronting racism, which it does. I wonder how Ithaca College is integrating anti-racism work into its curriculum. Thank you, Leslie. Great question. And so um, in December, at the end of the fall semester, we had three racist incidents happen on our campus in our classrooms. Um, students made me and the senior leadership team aware of what was happening. Uh, we held listening sessions for students. Uh, my student affairs VP, uh, Rosanna Farrow, uh, Chris McNamara, Professor Chris McNamara, who is the chair of faculty council. The three of us got together and held a listening session with students, we brought together all of the leaders of our uh, students of color organizations on campus. Uh, we wanted to, to just hear about their lived experiences on campus. As a result of what they shared with us, and, and I won't lie, some of these stories uh, were hard to hear and, and heartbreaking. Uh, I decided to ask the faculty to engage with me in, in a slow read uh, over the month of January. And so my office purchased 1,000 copies of Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist and made it available to anybody that wanted to have it on the campus, faculty, staff, or students. Uh, we distributed the books in, in January. And then as you well know, uh, by March, we were no longer on campus. Over the summer, our students, we had listening sessions for our students via Zoom because after the George Floyd killing, uh, our students were not on campus, but they were feeling the effects of it. 
uh, 24.2% of our students identified as students of color. And so this continued to bring to the surface uh, some of the racial tensions that are on our campus. So while we were home, faculty said, okay, Lejeune, we need to return to the book. You provided us with the book. We were gonna have you know, teaching circles, book groups around the book, but we haven't, we haven't talked about it. And so I asked the faculty through faculty council, uh, we have a faculty council executive committee that has six faculty members. I meet with the FCEC as they are called on a bi-weekly basis, but during the summer we met weekly so that I could hear what was going on with the faculty, keep them aware with what was going on on the administration side and for us to continue to keep our students uh, in, in our minds. And so I said to the faculty, I said, faculty council, I need you to take the lead in leading book circles to discuss this text. It's very important. Uh, you know, our students were saying our faculty need training, uh, diversity training. And I said, it's more about education um, and, and continuing education, not a one and done training. We need to read. We need to listen. We need to talk to one another. So the 25 faculty agreed to, to lead book circles. Not only did they discuss how to be an anti-racist, uh, they discussed uh, Robin D'Angelo's uh, White Fragility. Uh, some faculty brought in plays, but we had two weeks of discussion around this. As a result of this, our students, uh, we had a Zoom session with students to check in with them to see how they were feeling. And, and their questions were pointed. And they said, well, Provost, what's going to be different when we return to school in the fall? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, what, what are you expecting? And they said, well, we don't want empty statements from faculty telling us how they're going to be better. We want actionable items. And so to the credit of, of my white faculty, um, they got together and they had some hard conversations with each other. And they wrote a letter to the faculty and students and staff of color owning their complicitness in the maintenance of, of uh, structures, structural racism on our campus. And they said how committed they would be to changing things, which includes conversations around, you know, decolonizing the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we then we had an anti-racism institute that was started this summer. So 27 faculty members participated in an anti-racism institute and uh, applications for the institute just went out last week. And we have 43 new faculty members who said, I want to be a part of that. And, and if you get selected to be a part of the institute, you have to agree to take what you learned back to your department and share it with the people in your department, because we believe in, in the teacher of teachers model. But there's still a whole lot of work to be done. I'm not going to lie to you and say everything's rosy because it isn't. Uh, but we've got to confront a lot of our own personal issues. Um, we've got to learn. We've got to read. We've got to be willing to have courageous conversations. We've got to be willing to create brave spaces, not safe spaces, but brave spaces where we admit our biases, where we admit what we don't know and be willing to learn and to change because our students expect that of us. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you. That's a, fin that's a great history of what just happened uh, over the past year. Leslie, thank you very much for uh, uh, bringing that topic right directly into focus. And, and Lejean, thank you so much for, for itemizing that. That's quite a career um, for the faculty as well as the whole community to go through during uh, a pandemic as well. Um, there have been some uh, back and forth in the chat about, um, about uh, let's see, uh, about brave spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a couple of Ithaca College alumni here um, and, and uh, a couple of neighbors, someone just down the road from at Fayetteville. Um, so um, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of connections here today, which I'm really glad of. Uh, so, folks, if you have more questions specifically about uh, racism and anti-racism, this is a great time to ask. Keep in mind that we only have about 11 minutes left uh, before the end of the hour. Uh, let's see. The, uh, uh, 
And while folks are thinking of that, again, you can just press the uh, hand raise button just to join us here in stage. And in fact, I'll make, make it even easier. I just put on the screen a teal colored box. So if you just click that, that should haul you up on stage right away. Um, so if you want to join us and talk about uh, racism and anti-racism uh, and the experience of handling that at a small college, um, at a rural college under enormous stress, this is a great time to, uh, to press that. And while folks are thinking about that, I want to make sure that we get to a couple of other questions. Uh, this is one from Sarah San Gregorio. Um, again, back to uh, technology support. Uh, are you bringing in additional instructional support staff to help support this faculty? There's a danger of burnout for existing support staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not needed to hire additional support staff at this time. Mm -hmm. What this did teach us though, was the ways in which our Center for Faculty Excellence staff could work with our teaching and learning with technology staff to support our faculty. Uh, they each had their own website for resources for faculty. And we were like, wait a minute, why don't we put this together so it's all in one place? Uh, the instructional designers are in the teaching and learning with technology, not in the Center for Faculty Excellence. And so we said, wait a minute, let's think about the way we are organized. Can we move a couple of those instructional designers over to the Center for Faculty Excellence? And so we are really rethinking what we're doing as a direct result of what's happened to us and, and it's working. And so that's the, 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 I'm going to say that the silver lining of the pandemic is brought together uh, and created synergies that, that we really didn't even, you know, use or optimize uh, on our campus. And, and so now we're taking advantage of these resources in a new way to benefit not only our faculty, but our students as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a, a that's a, a great answer. Um, and um, before uh, before I welcome George to the stage, I just want to point out a couple of quick notes in the in the chat. Uh, David Hull recommends Unconscious Bias in Schools by Benson and Ironman uh, for reading. Uh, Erica Swain says, it's things like this, the willingness to change, why I always love Iska College. Uh, Joel Bloom says, Dr. Cornish, thanks to you. I'm going to encourage my son to apply to Ithaca. <laughs> and uh, Amy Cronin says, I'm an IC alumna, so I keep an eye on what's going on. So happy IC has Lejeune in these challenging times. So I just wanted to share all of that. And then I want to welcome our dear friend, George Station from CSU Monterey Bay. George, glad to see you. Hello. And um, is my uh, audio on? It is. It's oh, great. Really Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I guess as usual, uh, I haven't been in the forum for a while, but I usually bring two questions <laughs> and sometimes they're related. Uh, but um, um, to the immediate note, since we're noting books, um, I saw a disturbing article, I think it was LitHub, that was uh, noting that after a surge uh, over the summer, book sales on topics such as anti-racism may seem to be dropping back down as oh. if we're seeing things as an unfortunate fad, um, like people might think they're done or something because they gave it a little bit of work over the summer. So mm -hmm. I just want to encourage everyone who's white in the forum here today not to stop reading uh, just because we got through a very rough fall semester. Uh, but um, um, on the uh, other topic today, um, I was actually right-sized in my previous career. I'm retired uh, Navy. And so when I hear right-sized, I'm concerned about what happens next. Um, so I'm wondering what support, um, either HR or other type of support, um, the college will be offering any staff or faculty who might be in for a rough move during the pandemic. And how would you be guarding against a disparate impact on staff and faculty of color as any restructuring happens? Good questions. Um we still need to think about those things. And so if you are if you are a faculty member who is tenured and your position is eliminated, we need to give you the opportunity to retrain, retool, and to join another department where it makes sense so to do. If you are tenure eligible or a non-tenure eligible faculty member in a multi-year contract, we need to give you a, a terminal contract or a, a year of grace, I'd like to call it, uh, if your position is eliminated. We don't provide such a benefit for 
uh, tenure eligible faculty or non tenure eligible faculty who are in their first year. Uh, I had a, a town hall with faculty today, earlier today, and over 350 faculty attended that town hall with me and the entire senior, senior leadership team. And one of the, the requests made of us was if we could provide uh, continuing library privileges uh, email to our adjunct and contingent faculty who will be affected by the right sizing. And I said, while we had not yet had that conversation, um, I don't think that that's a great ask. And so we should, we will have that conversation to see, you know, how we can support them if that is possible. Um, we can at least have the conversation. Mm -hmm. As for our uh, faculty of color or BIPOC faculty, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, at Ithaca College, most of our continued faculty are white. Um, we don't have a lot of faculty of color. And the newest faculty of color are, are in our tenure eligible lines. Uh, and so they too will be impacted. And so we are looking at strength of program. We are looking at, at reductions holistically. But I have to adhere to the guidelines that are written in section 4.9.8 of the faculty handbook, which say that when we need to reduce, we start first with our part-time faculty, followed by adjunct faculty, followed by people in term appointments, followed by non-tenure eligible faculty, followed by tenure eligible faculty, and lastly, tenured faculty. Mm -hmm. As reductions are recommended, we will take care to look at the places in which these these faculty members work. We will look at strength of program and we will do the best that we can. But in closing, I have to say this, you know, these rules were written by faculty. And if faculty care tremendously for BIPOC faculty, now more than ever is a time to rewrite faculty legislation to provide protections for BIPOC faculty and afford them the same privileges that we do tenured faculty. If it means that much as an act of shared governance, they can rewrite legislation and I'll stop there. Okay, um, thank you for going there with it because my follow-up was going to be to ask if um, there was anti-racism work that needed to be done in your faculty handbook itself. Um, I know that faculty are capable of rewriting that. Uh, so if uh, faculty choose to do so, that would be certainly be outstanding. Um, and I'll uh, close. I, I know Brian only has a few minutes left uh, to say that that student question you got about uh, what's going to be different is one of the best questions from any level at any university I've ever heard uh, with any of this work. So um, I'm taking that question back to my own campus. So. Okay. All right, Brian, thanks for uh, taking my uh, uh, questions and comments today. Absolutely. Thank you for breaking them. Uh, really appreciate it. Always good to see you, George. Great, great. Thanks. Um, I, I am really conscious that we are almost out of time. So Lejeune, I'm going to try something kind of funky here. I'm going to combine three questions into one um, because they're all they're all combined and, and, and we can pull them apart um, uh, if you like, depending on how much on how much time you need with these. Um, one question has to, these are all questions about your response to, to racism. Uh, one question comes from uh, Charles Findlay, who asks about what areas of, I believe, the academic system can be revisited besides content decolonization. All right, so we've got that. Mm -hmm. And then we have a question here from uh, Michael Eisenberg from uh, University of Washington who asks, do you think that online learning exacerbates the problems of systematic racism or offers opportunities to improve? Mm -hmm. Let's put those two together. Can, can, can you riff on those two? I'm gonna do the best that I can. Um, we need to decenter whiteness in the curriculum. Whose story is being told? Whose isn't? Um, Whose voice do we hear? Whose voices don't we hear? I think to our school of music, uh, they do performances every year and our students of color said, can we ever study composers who aren't white? And so 
what my school of music did this year was to say, all right, we're going to make sure that we include pieces of women, of, I mean, pieces of music by women and people of color in every performance this year. Sometimes it's a matter of the question not being asked. Mm. And so mm. are we asking the question with regard to online learning? I'm going to say that online learning um, exacerbates things for students with the least means, regardless of the color of their skin. Um, this has been a challenge. And, and one of the reasons that we so want to open in the spring is many of our students have said how hard it is for them to learn at home. You know, it, it's heartbreaking to see a student say, I don't want you to see where I live. I don't want you to see yeah. You know, my, my learning space, can I please come back? So at least even if I'm learning in my room, if 80% of my classes for spring are online, I would rather be online in my room at Ithaca College than at home sharing Wi-Fi with five, six or more people in a space that's not dedicated for me to learn. And so um, this is pointing out a whole lot of disparities for a whole lot of people. Uh, first gen and beyond. And so um, we need to take note of, of, of the lessons that are still out there for us and think about ways that we can continue to support our students because this is not a, a one and done pandemic. We will be feeling the effects of this for, for years after this. It's going to take us some time to get it together again. And so I would encourage us to think, to ask our students how were you most impacted during your time away? What did you need? And then how can we help you moving forward? Well, the students at the center of that process. Yes. Lejeune, it is exactly the top of the art. Can I, can I share one more question from one more person? I have a meeting with my president, and so I'm going to blame you for being late. But okay, it's okay, okay. This is a really quick question. Oh, this is from Melanie Hogue at Southwestern University in Texas, and she asks, "How supportive and engaging are the people and businesses in the surrounding community in terms of your anti-racist work and your climate change work?" So I would say they're very supportive. All right. We have a group called the Local Leaders of Color Group, uh, which is comprised of faculty and staff from Cornell, Ithaca College, TC3, mm -hmm. and the local business community. And when I mentioned that I had asked my faculty, staff, and students to read How to Be an Anti-Racist, they asked their folks to do the same. And so mm -hmm. we are walking this together. And that's the only way we're going to affect change is if we walk together. Bravo. I, on that high note, I'd like to wrap things up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Heather Cornish, for being a fantastic, fantastic guest. Uh, I'm so delighted at your answers. It's just been a terrific, terrific look into how you've been thinking and responding and the great work you've been doing. There's a whole bunch of, of cheers and praise to you from uh, in the chat box and in Twitter. Um, I don't want to get you in trouble with your president, uh, especially now. Please tell them I said hi. It's entirely my fault. Um, What's the, what's the best way people can keep up with your work and what Ithaca College is doing? Uh, you can reach me through lcornish at ithaca.edu. Uh, I'm still a technological uh, immigrant, and so I'm still working some things out. So please be patient with me. It has been an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you today. I wish that you all stay well, be mm -hmm. well, and take good care. Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're a digital immigrant, you're always at home with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Long. And don't go away, friends. Uh, I just want to let you know uh, what's happening over the next few weeks. Uh, can I just say thank you all for your great, great questions um, and for everything that you've been sharing today. Um, and uh, thank you, especially from the alumni and from the people nearby. Just a quick look ahead. Uh, remember that we have one more Future Transform session coming up next week. That's on work-life COVID balance. And then we have the winter holiday. But then we pounce right back. We have a whole series of great programs coming up. Check my blog. Uh, we'll have a whole list of these. And of course, you'll be emailed about each one of these as they come up. 
Uh, our reading for our book club, Speaking of Climate Justice, is plunging ahead, so you can join us at any time for that. If you'd like to keep talking about all these issues, everything from anti-racism on campus to climate change and community to technological support, we have a whole bevy of ways for you to do that, uh, including Twitter. And if you'd like to go back into the past and look at how we've previously had sessions on these issues, everything from COVID to faculty, to racism, to climate change, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive for more than almost 240 recordings right now. Um, and in the meantime, let me just echo our provost and guests uh, wishes. Thank you all for uh, a great, great discussion. Um, Please, in this holiday season and the season of great chaos, please take care and be safe. I look forward to seeing you online. Bye-bye.